we want to talk about some myths here. So yeah, what's the fiber myth? I think the fiber myth is, you know, began in the 1950s and 1960s with Burkitt, who was a surgeon who went to Africa. I think he was obsessed with the idea of diverticulosis, which is the outpouching of these muscular or these submucosal layers of the colon through the muscular wall. And he observed that, you know, indigenous people living in Africa did not have diverticulosis at the rate that he was observing in the United States. It was sort of an epidemic. And then he also observed and correlated that they were taking lots of poops and eating lots of fiber. Then thus began the fairy tale of fiber and it's been perpetuated and perpetuated. But if you actually look at the data, the data regarding fiber and diverticulosis would suggest there's no benefit to fiber for diverticulosis. And it, the list goes on and on. If you look at the potential benefit or the question of benefit for fiber and colon cancer or pre colon cancer lesions, that doesn't show a benefit either. And then if you look at the potential benefit of fiber for hypertension or lipid reduction, that doesn't show a benefit. And then you look at the benefit of fiber for satiety, it doesn't really help that much with satiety. And then if you look at the potential benefit of fiber for, or the question of benefit for fiber for constipation, the studies clearly show that fiber makes you poop more, but it doesn't change the quality of your stool, the pain with stool, or the amount of laxatives that people use. So fiber doesn't resolve constipation. Just because you have more poop doesn't mean you're not constipated. You can still have pain, bleeding, hard stool that's not properly formed from fiber. Dist distension? Yeah, distension and fissures from large stools. That, you know, yeah. constipation is not an absence of fiber in the human diet. We know that. And so the fiber thing is a great big myth. But whenever I tell people, and maybe Sean gets the same thing, you know, whenever we tell people that we eat a carnivorous diet, the first thing they say is, you don't eat any plants? And you say, yeah. And the next question out of their mouth is, how do you poop? Yeah. And you say, well, it, was, it, it works. It just works. But it's such a cognitive dissonance. People are just not aware of this possibility. Well, it's, I mean, it's the same way a cat or any other animal. I mean, they, they still exactly. make feces. I mean, it's in, in, in we, Mark and I talked this off camera. I mean, it's basically your stool is mostly bacteria yeah. in, in whatever cells you slough off from the, uh, you know, the surface layers of your digestive tract. And that's what it's generally going to be. Um, some people consider fiber an essential nutrient, and it's not. I mean, there's essential nutrients to me are something if I don't have it I'm gonna die and if I don't have enough lysine I'm gonna die if I don't have enough fatty acids I'm gonna die after a period of time but you know I've gone three years without fiber and lo and behold I'm still here and I, I, I'm aware of people who have gone 20 years or more and so I think that uh, you know, some of the points you made, and you know, Ann Perry did that study in 2020, 2012, looking at colonoscopies on people, and the people that ate the most fiber and had the most bowel movements had the highest rate of diverticulosis, rather. And so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, uh, you know, a myth. And I think most of, the, most of the beneficial effects we see in fiber, again, go back to epidemiologic observational studies, and it may be a marker for a generally healthier diet. People that are told to eat more fiber are usually going to exercise more, usually not going to smoke less, you know, eat more natural foods, and that effect alone could count for all the benefit we see in fiber. That is the healthy user yeah. bias, yep. and that is such an important point to note that, again, this goes back to the fact that the media is just not educating people properly, that when we're looking at epidemiology studies, these observational studies, we always need to consider the possibility that whether we're looking at increased consumption of fruits and vegetables or increased consumption of uh, fiber, those can often be associated with, with other healthy behaviors. And it may be the other healthy behaviors that are benefiting those people rather than the fruits and vegetables or rather than the fiber. And there are some really elegant studies that, that suggest that that's very much the case. There's a study from Britain called the UK Shoppers Study where they looked at vegans or they looked at vegetarians, I believe, and they looked at the, the comparison of the standard mortality ratio of vegetarians to the general population. And as we see generally in westernized populations, vegetarians have a lower standardized mortality ratio than the general population. And then they did a really smart thing and they compared the death rate ratio, which is a little bit different measure, but they, that was the comparison of the rate of death of those vegetarians to non-vegetarians who also did healthy behaviors. They found people who, you know, who exercised and who didn't smoke and who got sunlight and who did other healthy behaviors, lo and behold, same death rate ratio. So all the benefits of being a vegetarian went away when they compared it to someone who had healthy behaviors. And I would suggest, and I think Sean and Mark would probably agree that this might, this is probably what we're seeing in all these studies. And again, it's fake news. It's the, the, the unfair reporting. 
and this misleading reporting people are doing, you know, we can never say for sure in any of these epidemiology studies, but it needs to be talked about. This is a real problem confounding these studies, and I think this is the same thing with fiber. Mm -hmm. We're looking at these healthy user biases, and then on the flip side, the other thing also exists. There's such thing as an unhealthy user bias. The fact that when we see studies saying that meat is bad for you, that meat is associated with decreased longevity, those are the James Dean types who are like, you know what, screw it all. I'm gonna eat meat and smoke and ride my motorcycle and not exercise. Because because in the United States, in the westernized world, we've been told meat is bad for you. So who eats meat? People who are rebels. Mm -hmm. And in the Asian countries, they've been told meat is what rich people eat. So the people that eat meat over there, are, they're seeing it as a health food, or they're seeing it as a reward, or they're seeing it as a status symbol. But in the West, we see meat as a rebellious food. You're going to smoke a cigarette, eat a hamburger, eat some french fries and a bun and have a Coke because you know what? You're fed up with everything. And that is a type of behavior that really makes it hard to separate whether it was the effect of the meat or everything else that person was doing. So, it's all getting into this murky epidemiology, and it, it really confuses people and does a great disservice to really sorting out what humans should be doing. That's so interesting. I think that plant foods, these fruits and vegetables, what if the only benefit they're, they're doing is getting you to not eat something worse? What if they have a zero impact and that it's just it's stopping you from eating processed food or something worse, and then the real nutrition comes from the animal foods? But I don't think it does. I don't think... I don't think Anybody eats kale instead of eating a Snickers? Well, yeah. <laughs> some people, well, no, some people who have, uh, you know, who, who have the sort of moral high ground in conjunction with a, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're able to uh, change their habits, you know, with a snap of a finger, can suck it up and do that. But that's not a lot of people. But you're, to your point, I mean, that's a start to, you know, I guess eating kale instead of eating, you know, uh, a loaf of white bread would be a step in the right direction. And I think we've sort of headed there. I mean, that was sort of my transition was to a plant-based, uh, not a plant-based diet, but at plants at the, at the base of my food pyramid. And then I'm slowly you know, pulling, pulling those away right now.